I feel like I'm always fighting an urge to get personal in my videos. Like way too personal and you know, like weird. My God, what if I posted cringe? Why, I could never show my face at the cotillion. That slanderous tot, Sarah Lee Frostingsworth would never let me hear the end of it. My God, how Death Stranding made people cringe. The story is just... We're one. Like before in the womb, remember? What are you talking about? You sound insane. <laughs> it's painful at times, really. Hideo Kojima was clearly bearing his soul for us to see. And this may shock you, but Hideo Kojima's soul is fucking weird. Me, I'm... I'm no exception. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? Not to mention the gameplay. You deliver packages. Can you think of a more idiotic core gameplay loop? Walk, deliver package, walk. That isn't a gameplay loop. That's a soul-crushing job. Hideo Kojima committed the gravest of sins. He posted cringe. And I absolutely love it. See the sunset The day is I love the Beatles. They were the first band I really got into as a kid, you know? They're also really emblematic of the changing music of the late 60s. The Beatles first started to gain popularity in 1964, and as I'm sure many of you know, were just a boy band. They wrote simple and fun songs, almost exclusively about love. I still listen to some of these. I particularly like I Saw Her Standing There. Allow me to summarize it. Damn, girl, you look good wanna dance. That's it, that's the song. I mean, it's catchy and fun, it's about young love. Well, young lust. And anyone can relate to that. That's what pop rock was, that's what people wanted. The Beatles were bigger than Jesus. This is them in 1965 taking the stage at Shea Stadium. That ear-piercing screech is 45,000 screaming fans blowing out their own eardrums because they were in the Beatles' presence. The Beatles stopped touring permanently about a year after this concert. They expressed resentment that they literally could not hear themselves play over the constant screaming. They owned the world with their safe and simple love songs. But the times they were a-changin'. What place did songs about holding hands have in a world that was being shown graphic and shocking images from the front lines of war every night on the news? A tumultuous time of presidential assassinations, civil rights leader assassinations, and just lots of assassinations. People in the 60s didn't like black people or Kennedys. I don't know, it was weird. But really, how could you listen to music about holding hands in a time like this? The simple and admittedly a little reductive answer is there was no place for those songs. Songs with lyrics like Love, Love Me Do, You Know I Love You, I'll Always Be True, were replaced with eight-minute mishmashes of ambient noise. Although I actually hate Revolution 9 because it's just a load of postmodern artsy bullshit, it sounds like what Yoko Ono probably screams when she orgasms. Why are you the way that you are? But Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band came out of this time period. No longer were the Beatles nice-looking young men in matching suits, they were now a mockery of a boy band. No more did they sing simple boy-meets-girl love songs, they now sang about love that was lost. The bittersweet and sorta of scary idea of growing old with a person you love. And even a song about a drawing that John Lennon's son, Julian, made. Yeah, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is not about LSD, I know, I was shocked too. But all these songs are still about love in the end just more complex interpretations of it. By breaking the mold, they could do that. By cutting out the screaming fans, they could look inward and write songs not just about love, but about what love meant to them. But it wasn't just the Beatles. 
popular music as a whole grew up in the late 60s. It became harder, louder, and weirder. Folk entered the mainstream. Songs proselytizing the evils of war topped the Billboard Hot 100. The daring, bold, strange, and artsy was also the popular, because that's what the people wanted. What the fuck are you even talking about? Uh, well... Oh, artsy fartsy musical cobbler YouTube man likes this game because... The Beatles. What's this video even about? Is this a review or a video essay? Yes. You know what? I don't, I don't care. Because this is starting to sound like an appeal to emotion. That's subjective. And this game is objectively bad because Dunkey said so. Okay. Is this game perfect? No, because it's not this photo of Kate Upton that I photoshopped Todd Howard's head onto. I make my videos far after the internet has already decided that a game is either the worst thing or the best thing ever. Because, you know, that's just the world we live in now for some reason. The council of neckbeards that is the internet has already reached a decision. This game is a broken mess. When in reality, it's just not for everyone. But that doesn't mean it isn't relaxing, atmospheric, and genuinely engaging. Seeing all the gamer rage may make you think this game's about as relaxing as trying to explain to your grandparents what a furry is, but it's actually really soothing. Death Stranding's core gameplay is walking. You walk from city to city delivering packages after an apocalyptic event known as the Death Stranding. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Now I actually detest walking simulators because holding down W isn't gameplay. It's just you pressing the continue the story button. If you're engaged with the story, then that's fine. But if you're not, it is excruciating. This could have been the problem with Death Stranding. Gameplay is nothing if not a series of problems that the player needs to solve. These problems are usually enemies, but in order for Death Stranding to work, the terrain needs to be the enemy. I think I realized that this game had truly succeeded at turning package delivery into interesting gameplay at this bit, where the game gave me an ass load of rocks and told me to deliver them over the mountains in a snowstorm. My reaction to this wasn't, fuck this. My reaction was, I'm gonna deliver the fuck out of these rocks. I am the one who delivers. Thank you. It's in excellent condition. You're goddamn right. A river, canyon, mountain, patch of mud, or even some rocks in Death Stranding is a formidable foe indeed. You have to decide what speed to walk at, at what angle to walk at, and even maintain your balance. Death Stranding is, of course, this is Obama, get down! The Dark Souls of walking simulators. Remember the first rule of game criticism, kids. Every game is the Dark Souls of something. The second rule is only accept cash from Activision because their checks bounce. It's much easier to deal with these obstacles if you aren't completely loaded down with packages, but the game forces you to strike a balance. Because many of the packages you'll carry are items for dealing with obstacles. You can bring ladders, ropes, a kit that can construct a bridge, generator, zipline, or shelter. Not to mention healing items, and even weapons for the enemies, that I will discuss later. Spoiler alert, I don't like them. Death Stranding looks like the boring portions between missions in most open world games, but looks can be deceiving. I enjoyed a standard delivery in Death Stranding more than most actual missions in Red Dead 2, because I was making decisions, solving problems, and planning ahead instead of just pressing the left trigger then the right trigger over and over. But what happens if you don't pack a ladder and find yourself out in the middle of bumfuck nowhere in front of a cliff? Haha, <laughs> you fool! You fell victim to one of the classic blunders! Well then, you can defeat that dastardly cliff with the power of friendship. You see, if you made a delivery to the city in that area, you also connected it to the chiral network, which is basically just the internet if you replaced all the furry porn with holograms. The important thing about the network is, it allows you and other players to leave tools behind for others. This turns an obstacle that could have stopped you completely into nothing more than a minor inconvenience as you look for another player's ladder or bridge. Sure, you're only rewarded with likes when other players use your items, but getting them gives you a warm and fuzzy feeling. Aww. The problem with this idea is that you don't actually get to decide to leave items behind for others. You can take these things down, but you don't get the item back, so the only reason to take it down is because you weren't hugged enough as a child and want to take it out on internet strangers. I don't know, I just feel like this would be more meaningful if you had to actually decide whether or not to help others as opposed to just doing so by accident. Still though, leaving behind signs and objects is a nice little mechanic. And some constructions require so many materials it can take several people to finish them. 
After a particularly rough encounter with BTs, these spooky ghost guys that are unique from the human enemies and that I actually like them, I left a nice little sign when the coast was clear. For no other reason than I would have liked to see one after that fucking gauntlet, and knew others would like to as well. This is an interesting mechanic that I didn't expect to enjoy that much because I really hate people. Just all of them, they're the worst. Which is probably why the only multiplayer game that I've talked about at length is Fallout 76, a game in which you can go literally hours without seeing another real person. So the idea of bringing other people into my hiking simulator actually bugged me. I wanted to play it offline like I do in Dark Souls, which is the Death Stranding of Souls-like games, by the way, thanks for asking, but I don't even know if that's possible because I haven't even looked for the setting. Why would I turn off the online components? Death Stranding is all about connecting, and the gameplay is structured in such a way that it forces you to depend on others. But it's not all teamwork and falling into rivers. There are two types of enemies in this game, mules and BTs. Mules are old couriers who have become addicted to delivering packages? It's weird, I don't know. Regardless, there's very little benefit to fighting them. You can get additional resources and optional packages from their camps, but if you're anything like me, you carefully consider what to bring into the field, and therefore have no desire to bog yourself down with the extra toilet paper and dildos that crazy UPS men collect. Honestly, I would just usually try to go around mules, because they're always knocking shit off my back and pissing me off. The enemies that I like, though, are BTs. They're ghosts. Basically, uh, they're usually invisible and are often placed exactly where you need to go so they can't be avoided. Apparently, you can fight them with grenades and special ammunition, which I never used outside of the mandatory shooting sections. I enjoyed stealthing around them, and where most stealth games allow you to see enemies at all times, even through walls, Death Stranding has you depend on a sensor to detect them unless you get uncomfortably close. It's interesting, mechanic-wise, and results in some very tense moments to break up the relaxing hiking. Getting caught by them is a pain, but if it wasn't, then these moments would lack the tension that makes them so interesting. I've said before that irritating mechanics in a game are justified if it pushes you into interesting or fun gameplay situations, but the mules really are testing my limits when it comes to that idea. They can put you in a high-stress and fast-paced situation, which can be interesting at times, but goddamn, I just hate them. You can kill them, but you're told not to because you'll create more BTs. But did I ever kill a mule? I killed them. I killed them all. Don't try it! You underestimate my power! They're like animals, and I slaughtered them like animals. I'm gonna kill you. As far as BTs are concerned, you can kill them, but I once again avoided it. I mean, there's just very little benefit to doing so, although you do unlock a stealth kill you can use against them in the late game that I would occasionally use. Honestly, I just enjoyed stealthing around them too much to bother with murder most of the time. Using that sensor and not being able to see where they are most of the time creates a weirdly claustrophobic atmosphere as you have to focus on a small area of the screen while knowing they're actually all around you. That sensor, by the way, only works because of a baby that the game refers to as a BB. There's a story reason for this, something about the, pff, fuck it, I'm just gonna call it a baby, being removed from comatose pregnant women. The BTs are dead people. The barrier between the dead and living is breaking down, as in the dead are stranded in limbo. Oh, that's why they call it that. So the babies living on this barrier between death and life exist in both worlds. It's weird, it's dark, and I love it. And while your mileage may vary, I developed a real attachment to the baby. His name is Lou, by the way, and when Lou began crying after I faceplanted or got caught by BTs, I felt actual concern. And the baby's temperament also manifests itself in the gameplay, as the baby gets sick and stops working if it becomes too stressed. So, why do you need to carry a baby in a jar around with you to detect ghosts? I don't know how many years on this earth I got left. I'm gonna get real weird with it. There are a lot of aspects of Death Stranding's world that are utterly surreal, beautiful, and just nonsensical. Rain ages everything it touches, including any packages you might be carrying. Ghosts are attached to this world via umbilical cords. Rainbows are always upside down. And you fight skeleton soldiers, because honestly... That stuff is cool. Most of it directly affects the gameplay in interesting ways, and it's all just visually striking. 
Death Stranding has a uniquely surreal and just isolating atmosphere, which I find enrapturing. At one point, I trapped myself in a valley by not paying attention to my surroundings, then had to use ladders to get out. I set up a generator to charge my robot legs, then sheltered from the rain in a canopy built by someone else as the canopy played a song. If you enjoy this sort of quiet solitude, then you'll enjoy Death Stranding. The game also has a solid difficulty curve and a fantastic sense of progression. Don't let those mountains and snowstorms I talked about earlier scare you off, because this game does ease you into it. The terrain becomes more difficult as you progress, from relatively flat plains to clusterfucks of rocks to mountains. Call now and you'll get mountains! Yes, mountains! <gasps> You unlock a truly mind-boggling variety of upgrades, tools, weapons, I mean, it's ridiculous, but I would say that most of them do have a place. I mean, you get robot legs. Robot legs are like dogs or tits in that they just sort of improve every game they're put in. As long as the legs have a full charge, they can make you faster, allow you to carry more, or just make you more stable. You also unlock a few vehicles as you progress. The game isn't really that engaging when there are no obstacles in your way, and the vehicles work best on flat terrain where the walking becomes nothing more than holding forward. Therefore, the vehicles skip the dull portions just as they become tedious while not skipping over the core gameplay of navigating rough terrain. The vehicles could have totally ruined this game by removing the core gameplay, but actually add another layer of depth by increasing the amount of decisions you make. Do you leave your vehicle behind for other players, or do you try to test your off-roading ability? The vehicles are unlike the zipline, which does fuck up the late game. Whereas every other tool in construction is used to solve problems, a zipline solves every problem at once, therefore removing depth. I would say the only redeeming quality to them is that I would often build a zipline just to connect it to another player's, so it does improve the cooperative aspects of the game a bit. Death Stranding is all about working together and doing what needs to be done, and this is reflected in the story. You play as Sam Porter Bridges, a delivery man with a name about as subtle and nuanced as a clown at a funeral. He's a solitary man, literally afraid of human touch. He trusts no one and goes it alone. In a previous video, in which I feel I didn't properly communicate my point, I tried to criticize AAA games for often defaulting to the angry, violent bastard with a heart of gold archetype. I saw this as a consequence of developers' fear of ludonarrative dissonance in combination with the fact that AAA developers are unwilling to break the mold gameplay-wise. If you're making a violent combat-focused game and want to maintain ludonarrative harmony, you sort of limit the type of story you can tell. But the story of Death Stranding is the gameplay. And the gameplay, being largely non-violent and only ever forcing you to kill weird ghost soldiers, is free to tell a different type of story. A story about a broken country coming together, and a story of a man learning to form connections with others. Shut the fuck up! Know your fucking place, trash! Earlier in the video, I talked about how a walking simulator must have you connect with the story because the story is all the game has to offer. But Death Stranding's gameplay is what I actually enjoyed. By the end, not only was I not playing for the story, I actually hated it. The baby stuff was interesting and I found Sam to be a compelling protagonist, but the game's story has pretty much every character's motivation be questioned at all times, which results in them seeming inconsistent. The story is also just a mess, I mean usually a fun mess, but every now and then I was just completely lost, uh, particularly at the end. Not to mention the frequent and obvious plot twists. Honestly, every twist is confusing, which I know itself sounds confusing. How could a twist be obvious and confusing? Spoiler warning, I guess, although the only way you won't see this coming is if you're a blind man with your head buried in the sand on the dark side of the moon. Sorry for the quality, I forgot to record this when I was playing because I'm an idiot. Anyway, when taking a delivery, you see this cutscene. Let me know if any part of it seems off to you. Oh, hi, uh, Sam Bridges, I presume? Sorry about that, the uh, system seems to be on the fritz. Uh, one of the packages wasn't processed properly and got left out of the order. <sighs> Anywho, really sorry for the hold up and, uh, careful. The contents are fragile. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, let's see, he's being vague, hiding his eyes, and clearly putting on a fake voice. Oh, and he sounds like Troy Baker, who plays a major villain in this game. Now, this is so obvious, I thought a boss fight was gonna happen. I mean, how could Norman Reedus just let him walk away after this? Like, holy shit, this guy screams sketchy. But, I guess all the time-altering rain gave Norman Reedus early-onset dementia, because he doesn't realize until later that... it's a bomb. Obviously. 
Yeah, this is only the first of many twists like this. It's just so obvious that you expect the characters themselves to realize it, so you get thrown for a loop when they don't. We've got to get rid of it. Take it down to the crater and next to South Knot. It's a tar pit. Damn your bottomless. If we chuck it in there, we just might have a chance. Death Stranding's gameplay explores the theme of overcoming trauma through connecting with others way more effectively than the actual story ever does. But a game's overall narrative is the gameplay and story working together, so I'd say the overall narrative is still effective because the gameplay just nails it. Which is what makes the rare parts of the game where it turns into a third-person shooter so weak. This is like if every now and then in a Mario game, you suddenly had to play a few levels of H-Doom. It just doesn't fit, and while Sam controls well when moving through terrain, having to deal with rough terrain doesn't work in combat. You're often looking at the ground in Death Stranding so you can look for obstacles, but you can't do that when you need to be looking around six feet off the ground so you can get sick-ass headshots. I, I know this game might seem off-putting, considering the, um, everything. I think you might have made a mistake. I don't think that one's for us. Oh, no. No, that's, that's for you. Your work is more cerebral than I expected. Say some more. But this is a relaxing comfort blanket of a game with solid mechanics, a great sense of progression, and a solid difficulty curve. It's true, the story is melodramatic and kinda cringe, bro. But it does have some great moments, and I imagine many will enjoy it. You know, after seeing a million hit pieces disguised as reviews for this game, I just thought nobody liked it. As I started to enjoy myself, I started wondering if I just had bad taste. Then I looked at the Steam user reviews for this game and saw that many people actually share my opinion. Impossible. Perhaps the archives are incomplete. But will you enjoy Death Stranding? You'll like the gameplay if you enjoy games like Elite Dangerous, which is to say, games where you go from point A to point B while dealing with small problems in between. You'll also enjoy the atmosphere of this game if you enjoy a surreal setting and can tolerate some artsy rambling and melodrama. Oh yeah, and can tolerate some whorish monster product placement. You'll hate this game if you can't tolerate a meandering story or gameplay that rewards acting slowly as opposed to quickly. I'm going on vacation soon and my plan is to go to rent a car, and just drive around. No goal, no particular things to see and do, just drive and take everything in. If that sounds appealing to you, if that sort of quiet solitude and listless wandering is how you unwind, then I think you'll love Death Stranding. Some people like a rigid itinerary so they don't miss anything when they travel, though. Which is fine. It's fine to look at something and say, you know what, this just isn't for me. I'm not into this sort of thing. You know, the reaction to this game was completely unjustified. I'm not saying you shouldn't criticize games, obviously, all art should be criticized. If a game lies in its marketing, or destroys itself with microtransactions, or is just a broken mess, then get angry. I mean, holy shit, you shed those angry gamer tears. They took your money, and they can go fuck themselves. Assert yourself! That's my ice cream cone. Great! Now let them have it! You can have it. Death Stranding isn't any of these things. It's a polished and interesting game, and when I looked up the marketing for it, it was honest. The trailers make it look more exciting than it is, but you're still delivering packages. You fight this guy. I mean, it's one of the worst parts of the game, but you do fight him. You run from these dickheads. The E3 gameplay was you delivering shit and avoiding BTs. Everyone knew what this game was gonna be. Finally got to see what this game is all about. Delivering packages. It's gonna be amazing. Death Stranding is one of the most disappointing video games I have ever played. The gameplay is walking. You put some packages on your back and you walk them from point A to point B. I'm not asking you to love Death Stranding. I'm not telling you this game is too smart or artistic for you because it isn't. And I frankly don't give a damn what you like to play. I'm just asking you to stop screaming. The Beatles never toured again after 1966, but they did perform live a few times. One of these performances was a rooftop concert in their hometown of Liverpool, just two days before the new year and a new decade. Gone were the matching suits, as well as the mockery of the suits. They were just who they were, and that was no longer a statement. Popular music had changed because people wanted it to. Audiences allowed artists to create what they wanted, and what they created was 
often beautiful. Actually saying something beyond I want to hold your hand in popular music was no longer groundbreaking. It was the norm. This was their last live performance before they broke up. There were a lot of reasons for this. The biggest of them being, they'd grown apart. You can see it just by looking at them. They were different people now, and had different artistic ambitions. But you know what really strikes me about this performance? No one's screaming anymore. Everyone is so quiet, and just lets them play. To quote Gene Park of the Washington Post, Video games are the new rock and roll. Parents don't get it. Politicians blame it for things it didn't do. And kids today want to be famous for playing Fortnite and not bass. I'm still waiting for that Sgt. Pepper moment. That moment where a game isn't just commercially successful or artistically successful, but both. I'd say the two most recent examples of games that were trying to be both huge mainstream hits and artistically significant were The Last of Us 2 and Death Stranding. Surprise, motherfucker! Are you following me now? They both failed miserably. They're both great, but they did fail because of the public perception of them. I get it, a lot of people have some very legitimate criticism against these games, but that's sort of the thing. My problem isn't that Death Stranding and The Last of Us 2 were criticized. If you played either of these games and thought, well this isn't very good, then that's fine. Open dialogue about a game is important, and of course, you know, you can have an opinion. My problem wasn't that they were just criticized, they were crucified. They were ritualistically sacrificed on the altar of the internet. They were mocked, review-bombed, and sensationalized. I rarely see legitimate criticism of these games, although that isn't to say that none exists. But I do often see some bizarre public shaming ritual. These games aren't greedy corporate lies designed to fleece money from you. And they're sure as shit not zeros, yet that's what their Metacritic user reviews show. Zero is... non-functional. Zero means this game has absolutely nothing for anyone to enjoy, but they just keep going. You know why the Steam reviews for Death Stranding are almost universally glowing endorsements of the game, while the Metacritic ones read more like angry people with a vendetta against it? You need to actually buy it on Steam in order to review it. You can't just watch a video about it, then go leave an angry review. The same goes for The Last of Us 2 on the PlayStation Store. And the same odd discrepancy appears there. These games aren't zeros. That's a narrative that some angry people on the internet made up. I don't think there's ever going to be a Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band for video games. Because there's clearly a very loud subset of gamers that refuse to allow games that break the mold to actually be perceived by the public as good. For an artistic and bold game to really make waves, in order for it to be a true watershed moment that influences the industry for years to come, it would have to be both financially successful and almost universally beloved. But the public perception of these games is that reviews are mixed. People think these games are divisive and controversial, but they're not. It's just a few people, many of which seemingly didn't even buy the games pretending that they're zeros. I often talk at work about my videos, and one of my coworkers accused me of being a contrarian when I told him I really liked both Death Stranding and The Last of Us 2. But that's the thing. I'm not. These games are almost universally loved. They are financially successful. He hadn't played either of them, but he thought they were complete trash due to the endless gamer rage that erupted from them. I'm not blaming him for thinking they were bad, because he just can't hear how much people love these games over the screaming. Art needs to be fostered. The culture that surrounds it and the way it's monetized both need to allow it to be created or it will only ever exist at the fringes of the medium. You know, if you had just watched the Beatles in the early and mid 60s, you would have no idea what they were capable of. The talent that this little boy band had. The endless screaming at their concerts wasn't vitriolic anger, it was unrestrained excitement from their fans, but it was still stifling. It was noise, the constant touring while being unable to hear themselves play stifled their creativity. You can't create in that environment, an environment in which no matter what you make, 
you still can't hear yourself over the noise. The Beatles couldn't achieve their full potential in that environment, nor could they reach their full potential until audiences became willing to accept unusual and experimental art. I wonder often about the true depth of talent that exists in the video game industry. The endless great ideas and bold concepts that right in this moment exist only in the minds of these creators. How many of these people don't just want to make a product, but want to make art? So do I think Death Stranding and The Last of Us 2 would have been as influential as Sgt. Pepper if they weren't crucified by some dudes on the internet? No, almost definitely not. It's not just that these games were sacrificed for being different, it's that their sacrifice sends a message. A message that modern gamers won't tolerate the unusual and artistically ambitious in the mainstream. Because a truly artistically beautiful game can't reach the same level of mainstream success as that album. The narrative around it would be twisted by those that have mistaken criticism for destruction. I'm not telling you to love Death Stranding or The Last of Us 2. I'm asking you to stop screaming. Just allow artistically ambitious games to be criticized and talked about. This isn't criticism. There is no meaning to be gleaned from an angry mob screaming into the internet.